Hey guys, welcome to another episode in the deep playthrough of AC Unity. The epilogue already finished the main campaign, but I'm now going through the whole database. Also part of a deep playthrough, the lore, the backstories, the historical tidbits on the persons and locations in the game. So a lot of reading. Uh, let's quickly continue. We uh, are now in the second uh, main um, category locations only need to do palaces and then the big one general but i hope that uh, a lot of entries i've already read in the in the actual uh, gameplay uh, playthrough and then i will skip them um, but if not i will read them uh, now we only need to do palaces and this one here so palaces louvre yeah we already read this one for sure. Yeah, we already read this one as well in earlier in the playthrough itself. Um, also this one read Also, this one we read. Ah, nice! Finally, some progress. Uh, because with the persons, so these are the locations, but the persons, there were a lot that I, I basically read all of them. But here, I'm pretty sure I've already read a lot of them. This one we read as well. Catherine de Medici made the palace. Built by oh Catherine de Medici, yes. And then um, this is also where Louis the Sixteenth barricaded himself, and um, the palace was actually stormed by the mob. I think on August tenth, and that really was the uh, the end of the monarchy, so to say. Yes, here it is, August tenth. Um, a revolutionary day that brought the monarchy's downfall. What was once Queen Catherine's Park had become the Republic's melting pot. I'm not sure. It says that there is a footnote. I don't see any footnote. I cannot scroll uh, down anymore. also would thought remember that it said something about I could have just as well read it now because I'm now uh, the amount of time I'm now scrolling uh, aimlessly is longer than just reading it but uh, out loud but I remember there was something said that the Catherine de Medici who built it They wouldn't have recognized it anymore, but I think that may have been another palace. Was that the Palais Bourbon? No. Maybe this one. No. All right, maybe it was this one. Ah, that's what I'm. Uh, confused about. This one is built by Catherine de Medici and here this one is built by Marie de Medici and I think this one we also already uh, read. For sure. And here this is the, the sentence I was looking for. Transformations overseen by architect Alphonse Dijon in 1836 modified the overall structure to the extent that Marie de Medici would probably not have recognized her former abode. The gardens, however, is a favorite among Parisians. 
it's pretty similar ending as this one because this one also refers to what was one Queen Catherine's and that was Catherine de Medici Medici's park had become the Republic's melting pot and here it is the gardens um, was uh, a favorite for parisians so it both ends with um, yeah a, a, a link to uh, one of the medici marie de medici and catherine de medici and the uh, the outside area the garden and for the other one it is called the park all right palais royal yeah i'm pretty sure yeah we read also this one as part of a um, Nostradamus Enigma and also as one of the missions I think before it um, so that is done let's go to the general this one I think is new or not read yet thanks uh, Boulevard de Théâtre thanks to Jean-Baptiste Nicole Le and his royally approved theater dubbed Spectacle des Grands Danseurs et Sautur du Roi. The Boulevard du Temple in the north of Paris developed into what could be called a continuous fair. The theater brought in all types of entertainment, along with cafes, caterers, and wine merchants. In addition to shows inside the venue, actors were hired to play out small scenarios called parades on a balcony in front of the theater in order to attract spectators. The construction of several theaters towards the end of the 18th century, no less than 16 new theaters built between 74 and 89, prompted the establishment of entertainment networks that became ongoing fairs. The revolution merely expedited this desire to free the theater from the oppression of an ancien regime that prevented the public from expressing itself. At the National Convention, Robespierre commanded the educational side of the theatrical arts and on January 13, 1791, the National Assembly abolished royal privileges, unshackled the theater and acknowledged as human rights authors' royalties, which had been written off on August 4, 1789, along with other privileges. Right, uh, Café Fevrier in the Palais Royal. Among the 19 cafes that comprised the Palais Royal, the Café Fevrier was located at 113 Gallery de Valois. It was famous for two events. Firstly, this is where Robespierre celebrated the proclamation of the Republic on September the 21st, uh, 1792. Secondly, it was here that on January 20th, 1793, Michel Le Pelletier de saint forgeot was assassinated. Who the hell was that again? Saint Michel de Pelletier saint forgeot God damn it. Ah, Mich Louis Michel Pelletier, the son of Fourchel, was born. All right. We already read this one. He was um, killed uh, the same day after he voted for the death of uh, the King Louis the Sixteenth.
Café Procop, opened in 1686 by the Sicilian Francesco Procopio Coltelli, the Café Procop went on to become one of the most prominent cafés of the 18th century. The intellectual center of Paris had shifted from the cafés of the left bank to those of the right, and the Procop, situated at the time opposite the Comédie Française, was an intellectual, fervent meeting place of playwrights, chess players, renowned actors, writers and philosophers. A list of the café's noted patrons of the period would include Voltaire, Diderot, Ben Franklin, Danton, Marat and Robespierre. Café Theatre Yeah, we already read this one for sure. This, I think it's also a um, real life building cafe theater. I thought this was fictional. Yeah, no, it's it's like that's what I was thinking. It's more like a category name, not necessarily the specific name of one establishment. A cafe theater was a small room in a cafe or a cabaret or even the cafe or cabaret itself where people would put on spectacles. Right, and here it says, yeah, it says the cafe theater. So there, but it also is like a generic sort name, so to say. Ah, Derek Woodward created the touring theater company. No. All right, very, very confusing. The Cafe Theater. All right. Um, Il Saint Louis. Il Saint Louis. Um, it's a performance hall and event venue in the municipality. Relevant links in Google are so annoying. All right, I don't know. Anyways, we already uh, read this one, so let's skip it. Sean Delize. <coughs> this was where Parisians who lived outside the rampart used to gather away from the mire and squalor of the city. It was a place for all sorts of outdoor pursuits, from the most innocent to those that were less laudable. The adjoining street, no, now known as Avenue Montagne, used to be called Allée des Veuves, the Widow's Avenue, because women in mourning gathered there. Talk about the singles hotspots. Funny. The Champs Elysees had its own special police force, whose reports give a highly colorful vision of the times. It was also the backdrop for political affairs. Paul Barra devised his conspiracy to overthrow Robespierre from the inn that belonged to. Antoine Nicolas Doyen, which still exists today as the Le Doyen restaurant. Been there, try the Rouget Lac du Jus de Beterave Acidulé. Tell them I sent you, but do not use my name or refer to me in any way. Again, such a lame footnote. By his own admission, we sought to agree on 
how to put an end to the excesses of the government committees and to help the national convention to regain its existence. In the evening, the conspirators met at the local Limonadier. I don't know, I think that's like lemonade, uh, some, some drinking uh, store. During the reign of terror, it was also the most inconspicuous means of passage among the unruly crowds to the Bois de Boulogne, Boulogne in order to hide. Only a dozen police officers patrolled it, suspects, escaped prisoners, draft evaders and vagrants would hide there among the foliage and thickets. Living the dream, boys. Haha, <laughs> funny. Alright. Um, yes, we sure read this one with Louis the Fat, so let's skip it. Club de Jacobin. Yes, I'm pretty sure we read this one as well. Um, earlier, either as part of the um, main story or as part of the Nostradamus enigmas. I think we already read this one as well. Yes, also as part of the Nostradamus Enigmas. I remember also looking up where these regions were. Piedmont, Alsace, Flandre and Artois. Because it mentions here that... Um, it got people from... Some, it said something about a part in the like west, north, east. Uh, one moment. Left a part of his fortune amidst while governor of France for eight years to build scholars. It was going to house 60 fellows. confused now because I'm pretty sure it said somewhere that the people uh, that's probably another entry or something but um, that it said something that the, the fellow selected came from I think the west or something it said and then I went uh, I've, I looked up all these four regions Piedmont, Alsace, Flandre and Artois and indeed they were a bit I think to the northwest so to say Alright, um, we read that one, sorry for being this slow also already read um,
All right, uh, let's just continue. Conciergerie. Um, this palace was the seat of the kings of France from the 10th century to the middle of the 14th century when Charles V abandoned it for the Louvre. By the early 15th century, it was primarily used as a prison, though the name Conciergerie from Concierge, keeper of the royal palace, stuck. By the time of the revolution, the conciergerie was the main prison in Paris. For many, it was the last stop before execution, which earned it the nickname Antichamber of the Eotine. The conciergerie was also called the most lucrative furnished lodgings in Paris. Prisoners were allowed to rent a bed for 27 livres a month, but since many were executed after only a few days, jailers could rent out the same bed sometimes 10 times a month. All right, we already read that one. Uh, the Ferme General, General Farm, was a much-hated private tax collecting organization that built a wall encircling Paris as a means to collect tolls on goods entering the city, as opposed to those much-loved private tax collecting organizations. Those guys are a bloody riot. All right, funny. The wall was marked by 62 barrier gates built in classical style, many of which still stand today. Suppression of the Ferme Générale was one of the most popular acts of the National Assembly. Grand Châtelet. Um, Yeah, we already read this one. Yes, for sure. Hal Oble, pretty sure we read this one as well. There was no roof on it initially. The land was purchased and a ring-shaped structure was built there. Initially roofless, in 1782 a wooden cupola was added. And then it received in, uh, eventually an iron cupola. Hospice des enfants trouvés, the meticulous chronicles Chronicler Sebastien Mercier left evidence of the tens of thousands of children abandoned in Paris. Mercier spoke of these exposed children who were often left on the steps of churches. The most famous among them was the philosopher d'Alembert, or in the Tower of Convents, or in the Towers of Convents. The Hôpital de la Charité, or Charity Hospital, was supposed to accommodate them with the income from certain fines, but new facilities were needed. With the financial support of Chancellor Daligre, a city square in the market bear his name, Queen Maria Theresa um, founded this hospice in 1670 situated on what is now the Square Trousseau. A subsidiary establishment would be built on the forecourt, forecourt of Notre Dame. All right, so that's Queen Maria Theresa. Is that the same one as... Uh, this one? Marie de Medici. No, oh, that's a different one, I guess. And this one is... Catherine de Medici. No. Although they both have that name, Marie... No, they know. They don't have Teresa in the name. Um, where were we? Locations. Hotel Dieu. Yeah, 
I think we already read it, but it's not that long. This is the oldest hospital in Paris dating to the mid 7th century. It was originally started as a refuge for the poor and sick, funded by the nobility as a charity. By the time of the revolution it had earned a terrible reputation. Those who died here were more likely to have contracted the disease inside its walls than outside. I hope that was the corporate slogan. Funny. The hospital had, uh, has undergone numerous renovations over the years, but it still serves as an emergency center for the first nine arrondissements of Paris. They must be thrilled. All right, Hotel de Ville. Yes, we already read it. Uh, this is the, still today the municipal government uh, location uh, building. Sorry, I could have just as well read it uh, out loud. I read it uh, quickly in my uh, head. This one we also read already. This is in Versailles. Ah, okay, I will quickly do it. Built at the command of Louis XV to house the organization responsible for preparing Royal ceremonies and festivals, the Hotel de Menu Plaisir in Versailles is most famous as the site of, site of the Estates General in 1789. Yeah, that was what I was looking for indeed. Uh, we, I think we uh, read this all at the start of the playthrough. During the revolution it served, this is where the prologue takes place, I think, of the game. Uh, or shortly thereafter. Uh, during the revolution it served variously as a courthouse, barracks and bread distribution center. Much of the historic building was destroyed in 1800 when the property was sold to a private citizen. Today the site is home to the center of the Baroque Musique de Versailles. La Bièvre, it's a river. Um, yeah, we already read it indeed. Uh, because it said only economic importance in that first section. And then the footnote probably indeed correctly says I think that's historian code for it was a vast and thorough river of shit, using it as a sewage probably. Yes, we read that one. Uh, Le Champ de Mars, the name of this green space, literally Field of Mars, is a tribute to the Greek god of war, since its loans were used by the French military as an exercise ground. Um, surrounded by ditches and trees, it was nevertheless left open to the civilian population and even served as an occasional playground for Parisian balloonists. It was thus a favorite leisure spot in Paris and would be the scene of the revolution's key moments starting from 1790. On July 14, 1719, despite heavy rain, a crowd of some 300,000 attended the Fête de la Fédération, uh, Fédération in honor of the anniversary of the storming of the Bastille. Sounds lovely, we must visit. In November 1793, former mayor of Paris, Jean-Sylvain Bailly, was tortured for two hours by a frenzied mob in one of the field's ditches before being beheaded by a purpose-built guillotine. His execution was intended as an expiatory ceremony. Actually, I'll leave it. On June 8th, what the hell is expiatory? One moment. Expiatory Having power to atone for or offered by way of expiation or propitiation Wow
The act of making amends or reparation for guilt or wrongdoing, atonement. Yeah, it really was an um, atonement ceremony. Tortured for two hours and then beheaded. What is propitiation then? All these terms, god damn it. This one is not in the game, but I read it in the definition. The action of propitiating or appeasing a god. Propitiate. Win or regain the favor of a god spirit or person by doing something that pleases them. Man, these words. All right, whatever. Um, on June 8, 1794, the Chant de also hosted the Feast of the Supreme Being, devised and celebrated by Robespierre, subsequently frowned upon as a parody by his Jacobin colleagues, and which would hasten his downfall. Leveled and extended, it would offer Gustave Eiffel the perfect spot for his giant steel structure 140 years later. Thereafter, the Champ de Mars served as the setting for princely weddings, national workshops, and horse racing, uh, followed by concerts and imposing firework displays in the 20th century. Le Catacomb. The left bank of Paris is built on rich limestone deposits. The stone from which built the stone from which built much of the city. All right, that is grammatically not super fluent. Initially, the stone was mined from the stone from which much of the city was built. I would say. Initially, the stone was mined well out from the city proper but as Paris expanded it readily covered even the mined out areas since medieval mining involved digging as well a well down to the stone deposits and then tunneling horizontally until the vein was depleted. The result was a vast intricate maze of tunnels beneath the streets. A series of building collapses beginning in 1774 proved that the tunnels could no longer be ignored and in 1782 Police Lieutenant Thiro de Crossen, de Crossen decided to act, by which they mean he decided to do something about the situation, not that he decided to put on a small play. Oh, funny. Thiro had the quarries within an area of 240 hectares survey, surveyed and registered. He saw the old mine shafts as an opportunity to solve another pressing problem, what to do with the bones of hundreds of thousands of dead people from the Innocence Cemetery which were so densely packed that they literally spilled out into the basements of adjoining buildings. Sleep well tonight. Thanks to Tiru, 6 million deceased were crammed to the quarries, sometimes 30 meters thick. Among the mortal remains are those of Tiru himself, along with 1800 victims of the September massacres of 1792. Later architects transformed the caverns into a proper mausoleum, complete with the following epigraph by poet Jacques Delisle, stop, here lies the empire of death. Bones and skulls were arranged in intricate patterns and special chambers were set up, museum-like, to display samples of the various types of stone found beneath Paris and the innumerable skeletal deformities to be found among the catacombs inhabitants. These unusual aesthetics have made the catacombs, catacombs a popular tourist destination since the early 1800s. Yeah, for sickos. Alright. Oh shit. God damn it, so much reading. Ah, but we are. Alright. Les Halles.
All right, yet another city within the city, Les Halles, was appropriately known as the belly of Paris since this is where Parisians bought their groceries each morning. There's a fat French bloke downstairs we call the belly of Paris too. Ah, funny. Before becoming a market, it wasn't at Jesus Christ. These footnotes are so unfunny. I don't understand that anybody within Ubisoft that no one said, let's skip them. I cannot imagine the person who made these footnotes. He must be the most unfunny person around. Um, before becoming a market, it was an expanse of little fields confirmed by the names of two streets, Rue de Petit Champs and Rue de la Croix de Petit Champs. The market operated up until 1866 when architect Victor Bauta completed his massive glass and iron market pavilions after 12 years work. It was a model that all of Europe would imitate. Not until the 1970s was it finally pulled down and replaced by the present day concrete jungle over which a huge glass canopy was recently installed. Again, something probably beautiful destroyed by backward modern architects. Les Invalides. Yes, we already read this one. It's about the hospital for invalid soldiers. Again, with a totally unfunny note at the end. Uh, this tower is the last, yeah, we already read this one. Newspaper stands, one of the most, and printing presses, one of the most spectacular aspects of commerce during the revolutionary period was the booming printing driven by the explosion in the number of publications. Before 1789, censorship tightly controlled the production of literary works, including periodicals. Wow, that's bad. With the revolution, however, the printing industry blossomed. In June 1789, only five newspapers were on sale. By December of the same year, the figure had risen to 130. Among the most important papers of the revolutions were Camille Dem Desmoulins' Le Vieux Cordelier, Jacques Brissot's Girondist, uh, Le Patriote Français, Jacques René Herbert, Le Père Duchesse, Duchesse, Duchesne, and Jean Paul Marat, L'Ami du Peuple. These papers reached a huge number of Parisians, even those who were unfamiliar with reading. Since it was not uncommon to find individuals who read articles aloud in the middle of the street to persuade others. Alright, Observatoire de Paris, Paris. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I've read this one, so I'm gonna skip it. Pantheon, uh, this, I really should have read this one as well, yes. Yeah, we read that one, Place Dauphine, I think as well, way back. Yes, we read that one, Place Vendôme. Yes, we read this one as well. I was commenting on how... Um, again, I forgot the term. Even when I commented on it before, I wanted to look for the same, use the same word and I couldn't find the term. It's uh, like super self-centered and egotistical, not narcissist. Yeah, I was commenting on that it's quite narcissistic for a Roman emperor to just, or for somebody who to put like a me mega statue of himself on a central square wear in Roman emperor clothing. Um, yeah, Louis XIV apparently did that. Uh, but yeah, we read it. 
uh, about that. Plus La Revolution. We also read this one uh, on the uh, little footnote on omnipotence. Omnipotence. Plus the Vogue. Also read this one. Also, as part of um, at least the Nostradamus enigma over here, and or that I thought was here. Uh, yeah, I think there was actually one here, uh, and also before that, I think. it as well as part of the regular gameplay Yes, it's also also um, mentioning the name changes, and that was actually a clue in the Nostradamus riddle um, for the uh, enigma that was uh, located here on this uh, in this square place, Sorbonne. We already read this one. When we went there earlier, I don't know as part of what, the main campaign or I think it was maybe a co-op mission or something. Or no, just finding collectibles, maybe that was the reason, yeah. This one we read all at the, at the end, this guy got sick I think. did not uh, it wasn't sick but we for sure read this We're almost there, nice. Um, oh shit, I forgot, I'm already over the 40 minute marker. Uh, let's quickly get through it. I think we uh, read all of them already. Um, this one. Yes, we for sure uh, read this one as well, not that long ago. Uh, also as part of the uh, Enigmas, Nostradamus Enigmas, the Bastille, for sure I read this one, yes with that joke, yeah I have an idea for cost cutting, just fire 247 soldiers over here, we read this one earlier in the uh, gameplay as well, much earlier. I think we also read this one not too long ago because it was also uh, a clue in the Nostradamus Enigmas. Polemic, that is the, like a dissertation, right? I think a couple of episodes ago I also looked it up. Yes, a strong verbal written attack on someone or something. Yes. Uh, yeah, we read this one, I'm pretty sure. And then Ecole Militaire as well. Um, yeah, 
Yes, about Napoleon Buenaparte being uh, uh, a student here in this Ecole Militaire and graduating as a second lieutenant aged only 15. That's crazy, after 12 years of study. All right, really happy that I could go through here relatively quickly. Uh, and that means that all the locations uh, are now covered. I already did this one, did this one. Districts as well, churches and the bridges. All right, so we still have the uh, miscellaneous left. And I'm not sure how much this is. I didn't read a lot of these yet, but uh, yeah, we will just have to see in the next episode guys hope you enjoyed hope to see you there for the meantime do not forget always to keep on gaming see you later